This is Duke University. All black everything, everything black, culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back, black. Welcome to Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're joined today in the Left of Black studios here in the John Hope Franklin Center at Duke University with Professor Erica Lorraine Williams, who is Assistant Professor of Anthropology at Spelman College in Atlanta and the author of the new book, Sex Tourism in Bahia, Ambiguous Entanglements, just published by the University of Illinois Press. It was also the winner of the National Women's Studies Association's first book prize. Congratulations Thank on you. that. Congratulations on the public publication of the book. So this is a book about sex tourism. Um, how did you get interested in that subject matter and why Brazil? Okay, um, well I think it all started really when I was studying abroad in Brazil as an undergraduate at New York University. I uh, spent six months in, um, in Sao Paulo, well, five weeks in Sao Paulo and then uh, about five months in Salvador Bahia and I was a senior in college. And I just saw all of these uh, interesting couples, right? I saw these older European men with young uh, Afro-Brazilian women. And I also had an experience that I write about in the book where um, I was with another African-American woman friend. Um, we were on the beach and we always uh, had this little thing where we would speak in Portuguese to each other so that we can blend in and not be you know, seen as foreigners. So um, we were on the beach and talking in Portuguese and these Italian men approached us and started talking, you know, speaking to us in broken Portuguese. And within about five minutes, they were trying to bring us back to their hotel rooms. And then at that moment, I switched to English and I spoke to my friend. I said, what are they thinking? What are, you know, who do they think we are? And they said, they apologized profusely. And they said, oh, we're so sorry. We didn't realize you were American. We thought you were Brazilian. So that really sparked something. And it made me think, OK, well, if we were Brazilian, did that, does that just automatically mean that we're available in that way? What is the expectation that foreign tourists have when they go to a place like Bahia? So that's really how it started. It started with um, a study abroad experience as an undergraduate in Brazil and just what I saw when I was there. Yeah. Unpack for the audience this idea of sex tourism. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's obviously a provocative notion, um, but you know, it's almost, a, is it a tourism around sex, you know, on mm -hmm. one level or just people who as tourists, you know, get to particular spaces, exotic spaces, as, mm -hmm. as you argue in the book, uh, expecting for, you know, to be able to con consume certain kinds of sexual desires. Yes, I think that's, that's getting exactly to the definition. Um, it's sex tourism has been, has been written about and, and discussed since about the 1970s mm -hmm. all over the world. So in Southeast Asia, places like Thailand, the Philippines, um, early on it was very much linked to military, you know, to mm -hmm. military um, prostitution, um, places like the Caribbean and in Brazil. There's been a lot of literature written um, coming out of uh, Cuba and the Dominican Republic mm -hmm. about sex tourism, particularly within anthropology. Um, so basically, one of the things that I found in Brazil, or in Bahia in particular, that makes it unique is that some, sometimes people describe it as travel um, with the explicit intent for you know, sexual services, right? But in Bahia, a place where cultural tourism is also very big, right? Where blackness is eroticized mm -hmm. and marketed, right? To sell Bahia as the black mecca. I found that there's, there's connections between cultural and sexual tourism, so that there's a way in which Tourists may travel for, you know, to learn about Afro-Brazilian culture. They may travel to, to learn how to drum or to dance or to do capoeira, but they also see sex as That's a part, part of it. that experience. Right. So it's kind of like woven into the fabric of the tourism industry. You mentioned from your own experience, uh, you know, this interaction with a couple of Italian men. Um, how much of this knowledge of what's happening in Brazil has really come over to the United States amongst uh, American tourists in terms mm. of looking for that kind of experience also? I think it's really pervasive also. I mean, uh, 2005, I think Jelani Cobb wrote yeah. that piece in Essence that got a lot of attention. Um, so there's a particular market for African-American men going to mostly places like Rio. Now, you mm -hmm. don't see as many African-American men going to Salvador Bahia. Um, the market in Bahia is very much um, European, you know, there's a lot of European, some, some North American as, as well, but the biggest groups were kind of Italians and Germans at the time that I was doing my research. What are the differences between the two cities? You know, I'm not, that's, 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 inter that's an interesting question. Because, um, you know, I keep thinking it, about the Pharrell and Snoop Dogg video, yes, right? Yes, that, 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 yes, you know, we're, This really, I think, comes on the, on the radar mm -hmm. of, of African Americans at that point in uh -huh. time. Yeah. Certainly, certainly. I think the racialized erotics are different in Rio and in Salvador, right? Because in Salvador, Bahia is a place that, you know, uh, roughly 80% of the population is of African descent. 
Um, whereas Rio is seen as more, you know, mixed, more multiracial. And so, yeah, you have a video like that, like you mentioned, where um, there's that line that said, hair, black and curly, like she's Cuban, right? right. So there's a particular kind of, um, of, of, of lens, of right. a particular kind of woman that people are looking for. Whereas in Bahia, black women, women of African descent, are seen as the, you know, the kind of desirable, um, you know, the object of desire. You mentioned that the country was very interested in making sure this this kind of black eroticism, this eroticism of blackness, was part of the tourism industry there. Um, I mean, what does that look like from, you know, a, a municipal standpoint, from the standpoint of the mm -hmm. state? I mean, how do you actually bring about that as a reality? Yeah, so in Bahia in particular, not necessarily Brazil as a whole, but Bahia in particular, as a place that try, that markets tourism, that markets itself as the black mecca, um, you see, I mean, I've collected over the years postcards of black women, you know, with their behinds and, you know, like yeah. that's the major focus of the, of the, of the image, right? Or, you know, there was one that was so, um, that even had a fly on a black woman's behind and the caption was the fly with no shame or another one that was a black woman, you know, from the, from the back and she was on a, a secluded beach and the caption was the north coast of Bahia. So this, this caption didn't even mention her presence, right? That she's the main focal point of the image, but yet the caption doesn't even mention, you know, her existence. So that's, you know, how some of the ways that they kind of market um, Bahia to the rest of the world. You're watching Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony. We're joined by Erica Lorraine Williams, who's an assistant professor of anthropology at Spelman College. She's the author of the new book, Sex Tourism by Ea. Ambiguous Entanglements, just published by the University of Illinois Press, and again, winner of the first book prize from the National Women's Studies Association. How do the women who become part, you know, sex laborers in this context, how do they internalize this desire? Um, you can, and you, you talk to a whole range of folks in this experience, including some of these women, mm -hmm. you know, who are working as part of the sex industry there. Um, how do they internalize this process of, of what value they have, you know, both to the country, but also in terms of on a personal level? Mm -hmm. it, it varied. It varied, right? Um, I worked with this sex workers association called Aprosba, and um, many of the women I talked to, they challenged my, my assumptions and my thinking about sex tourism. What, mm -hmm. what, what the, you know, the media tends to portray um, wasn't really the reality that they talked about. So, for instance, you know, uh, you may tend to think of sex tourism as just you know, exploitation and mm -hmm. things like this. But a lot of times what they talked about was the issues that they were facing, that they were most concerned with were issues like police violence, police brutality, um, clients not paying. And so with, um, with foreigners, they saw more opportunities in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, and that's why I talk about ambiguous entanglements because they saw um, having sex with foreigners as a way to, to kind of escape, um, you know, certain restrictions that they had on themselves, right? right? Restrictions yeah, right, right, so right. even this ambiguity of, you know, is it just a sex, um, money for sex transaction, or are there gifts involved? Are there trips involved? Does it, you know, does it lead, lead into some kind of dating, you know, right. what I call namoro in Portuguese, dating situation, um, or, you know, the opportunity to travel? So all these things were kind of, um, you know, caught, caught up in this, in their understanding. How many, were there possibilities for long-term relationships in this context? Mm -hmm. um, there was a dream of it often. You know, it didn't actually, you know, play out a lot of times. You know, there are very few exceptions. And this is something that I think is common in the literature as well. Um, for instance, Denise Brennan writes about sex tourism in the Dominican Republic. And mm -hmm. she talks about how this was a big uh, dream and, and, it, and it had implications. And people often worked towards this dream, but it didn't often translate into reality, right? It was very few cases where you would actually have this kind of, I'm going to migrate, I'm going to marry someone and migrate to Europe and live ha happily ever after. Yeah. When you went in to start doing the, the research, I'm sure you had all kinds of expectations of what you would find. What were the big surprises? Hmm. I think the biggest surprise, again, what I already mentioned about how, you know, the sex workers articulated their biggest concerns, right? Yeah. That, that kind of challenged some yeah. of my assumptions about what I would what I would find. The other thing that was very um, surprising was um, how. So, for instance, I researched. I, I did in, in, ended up did, doing interviews with tour guides and tourism industry workers and cultural workers, who also felt implicated in sex tourism. They because they felt like there was an expectation that that was just part and parcel of their responsibility. Right, so for that. yeah. So for instance, you know, I interviewed uh, uh, several tour guides 
who were asked by clients, you know, can you hook me up? Let's, you know, can, where can I find women or men where, you know, and they were asked, they kind of felt, um, you know, some of them felt odd about this, right? Mm -hmm. Because it was almost as if they were brokers or they were these intermediaries. But on the other hand, they, they felt like they had a responsibility to protect their clients or to keep them away from certain risks or dangers. So it was a really kind of tough position to be in. And I, that really shed light on how pervasive um, the expectation is, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing was also talking to uh, many Afro-Brazilian women who were not sex workers, but who were often, if not always, mistaken for sex workers, just moving through the tourist you know, the tourist spaces of Salvador. So this has to do with these, you know, assumptions of black hypersexuality and, you know, the ways in which black women, Afro-Brazilian women constantly had to negotiate how they were perceived by foreign tourists who thought that all, you know, that they were all available, that, you know, they didn't see a line between, okay, sex worker and non. It was kind of like black women, you're all, it's open season, right? So those, I think, were two of my Did you find findings. there were examples uh, in the country of younger girls and women who really thought that their only aspirations were to go into the, the, the sex work mm -hmm. industry. Um, and because I'm wondering, you know, as you talked earlier about these kind of aspirations that, that the women who worked had about what quality of life they could have, um, I'm wondering, you know, what, you know, do they become a kind of unique commodity in that context and what does that do for the other women, hmm. you know, black women in the country? Hmm. Um, you know, it, it definitely seemed like for black Afro-Brazilian women, for instance, who did not have a higher level of education, sometimes it seemed as if domestic work or sex work were kind of the only, some of the no, only options. avenues right. open, right? right? And so I talked to, um, you know, several women who felt like sex work was more, you know, advantageous than domestic work because mm -hmm. with, if they do domestic work, they're underpaid. They often work with, uh, without their workers' card signed, which means they're not getting, you know, state benefits, social security. They're often at risk of sexual assault and, you know, different mm -hmm. kind of things if mm -hmm. they, especially if they live in the houses. Um, so there was a way in which, you know, uh, they, they felt like sex work was an, was an alternative for that. Like, it almost gave them agency that mm -hmm. they might not have had. Yeah, situations. and I think it's also important to point out that in this context where I was studying, there wasn't a lot of pimps, you know, okay. there wasn't an issue. A lot of the women were working on their, oh, own. their own. Yeah, yeah. Right. so they weren't right. kind of controlled by these other, these third parties. A different kind of question. Um, you teach at Spelman College. Mm -hmm. um, there are many HBCUs that are viewed, obviously, as conservative. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, what, what What's it like having this be your first book and, and the subject matter, you know, in a space like, and, and Spelman might be a little different, right? You know, this mm -hmm. is a space that, you know, has very often encouraged a, a real significant kind of gender critique, you know, the great mm -hmm. work of folks like, you know, Beverly Gashefto and, and Bahati Kumba and folks like that. But, but how has your research played, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, in, at a place like Spelman or across the yard, of course, at, mm -hmm. at Morehouse? Well, I mean, I think my book just came out in November, so we'll see as more people read it. <laughs> we'll see, you know, if that, but so far, so good. I haven't had any, um, any issues there. I've been uh, welcomed. I feel very supported. Um, you know, Beverly Gashapta is a very important mentor of mine. And um, I'm also on the steering committee for the Women's, uh, the Women's Research and Research, Resource Center, right. so that's a very good space. Sociology and Anthropology Department is a very... Um, progressive kind mm -hmm. of space. I also teach a course called Sexual Economies. Mm -hmm. That's an honors elective. And so that's been very, um, you know, I've taught it about twice. I'm teaching it in the fall as well. And so in that course, I talk about issues like sex tourism, also trafficking, mail order brides, all these kind of ways in which, um, you know, money and mm -hmm. sex and intimacy kind of intersect. Um, so I haven't had any issues so far. <laughs> yeah. What's the next work for you? What's yeah, the next, project? the next work. So I'm working on two things right now. I wanted to get more, uh, do some research on Afro-Brazilian feminist activism in Bahia, mm -hmm. because right now it seems like there's a kind of burgeoning black feminist movement. There's a new organization called Odara, uh, the Institute of the Black Woman, that's it, that was founded in 2011 in Bahia. Um, and there's just a kind of, that's a big one, but then there's just all these other different neighborhood organizations and different kind of organizations that are led by black women that are really trying to kind of change the, you know, the landscape of inequality, race, racial and gendered inequality in Bahia. Um, so I've started some research last summer working on that. And I'm also interested in um, I'm collaborating with Kristen Smith and Keisha Kahn Perry, who are also uh, do research in Bahia. 
on trying to do an edited volume of Afro-Brazilian feminist writing. So something like a words of fire, but Brazilian, you know, with Afro-Brazilian feminist, feminism. Because I think it's really important that when we talk about black feminism, it's, it goes beyond the U.S. context, right? That we need to kind of expand it and have these transnational conversations as well. And I've, you know, had some experiences in Bahia where, um, you know, they, the black feminists in Bahia or, you know, in Brazil, they know, they can quote bell hooks, Patricia <laughs> Collins, they can quote, even if they read it translated, if they don't yeah. speak English fluently, they can, they know our work, right? But yet, how many of us know no, about right. Lelia Gonzalez, about Sueli Garnero, about, you know, all the, you know, the black feminists in Brazil who've been writing and doing uh, important work for, you know, since the 80s, if not before. So I really want to try to contribute to that. We've been joined by Erica Lorraine Williams, who's Assistant Professor of Anthropology at Spelman College in Atlanta, the author of the new book, Sex Tourism in Bahia, Ambiguous Entanglements, just published by the University of Illinois Press, and the winner of the first book prize from the National Women's Studies Association. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Black lights and booze burn when I record for Watts, and every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. All black, everything, everything black, culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back, black. All black, you know, all black.